Hey, Larry. Hi, Andy. How are you? Great. Have you been out to that gorge lately? Well, I'm thinking about going up a gorge before the summer's out. Okay. If you need an Uber, man, let me know. I will uh, totally hook you up. There, it's about a $150 ride. It, it would be worth it. I think our people would be happy. <laughs> All right. Please consider making us part of your podcast diet. You can find us at Registry Matters on your smart speaker or podcast app of choice like Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. Also, if you like what you hear, here, please write a review. If you don't, forget everything I just said. You can support us at patreon.com slash registry matters. Larry, who's talking to us this week? Who's talking to us? I have no idea. Well, we've received a comment on the website from Matthew. From Matthew. Matthew was asking what? about the uh, the registration laws in Utah, and he says that they're pretty draconian. And I want to know what you think. I'm an offender in Utah. There are residency restrictions everywhere in Utah, not to mention you can't go to public parks and some state parks. Well, my my response to Matthew is I haven't looked at the Utah statute in the last couple of years. My last analysis was that the registration laws in Utah were not that draconian. It depends to what Matthew's comparing it to. If it's only Utah that he's analyzing, and he's only looking at a state uh, without comparing it to the southeast or even some states outside the southeast that are really draconian, it would look it would it would appear that way. And then sometimes people compare the local add-ons and say the registry is draconian because of the local add-ons. But see, that's not the registry law. If the state has a registry law that has no restrictions in it and the, the counties add the 1,000 foot or 2,500 feet in the case of like Miami-Dade County we talked about last uh, episode, yep. that you can't blame that on the registry. The registry is not doing that. Or the registry is just, uh, just going to visit your local police station to give them fingerprint and update your address stuff. Unless they have additional requirements. But the last time I looked at Utah, I didn't remember the state registration scheme having any residency restrictions or any proximity restrictions. So any of those things that are being applied are probably being applied by the supervising authorities or by uh, by local or county, city or county uh, government. So that you can't blame the registry law per se if the cities and counties are, are stacking stuff on because the state law is not doing that. Now, the state law is not preempting them if they're doing it in Utah, but it's not it's not the state registry law doing that. He's not paying a thousand dollars to notify the neighbors like they're doing down in Louisiana. He's not carrying a driver's license that has sexual offender and orange orange letters like a number of states, including Alabama. He's not being get, uh, required to get a travel permit as a condition of the registry to leave his his, his uh, county like they were requiring in Alabama. There's a whole lot of things that are going on around the country that are they're pay, paying registration fees as much as uh, I think two hundred fifty dollars a year as the highest one I've heard of. Don't think they're doing any of those things in Utah, so that it would not be draconian as compared to those things. But it's draconian because I don't, I don't ab- agree with registration. Period. But if you compare it to a place, we'll just pull Vermont out, where you're just mailing in a form. I, Utah would seem draconian, so just by comparison. But it sounds like Utah is roughly <laughs> average, maybe. Maybe, I'll have to do some further research on the state statute. I know they did change the. A few years ago, they they wanted to stop the out-of-staters from coming there to gain a benefit. So the out-of-staters are now required to register pursuant to the terms of the state of their conviction. Utah okay. is one of the only states that, 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 that imposes that requirement. We have an article coming up that that's about something along those lines. Sounds. I have an exciting announcement, though, Larry. What is that? I have a big package of blue balls coming in the mail. Blue balls? Blue balls. Blue uh, stress balls that you can squeeze. Well, squeezable balls. Squeezable blue balls with the Registry Matters logo on it. Would this be like something you could do to build your hand strength, like a like a, a, one of those exercise balls? What do they call those? Uh, I don't think this would be something to strengthen your grip. This would be something for you to bring to your treatment class, and as you're there losing your mind over the idiocy of it, that you would have something to possibly divert your stress out of your system. And I'm still trying to think of different ways to, to give these out to people, 
But specifically, if you go out and leave a review, hopefully a five-star review at the uh, places sort of like iTunes or Stitcher, it helps people find us. If you retweet the podcast and you've got a whole bunch of followers, I will be happy to send you one of these one of these stress balls. Well, I can't wait to see the balls when we get to, to the conference. Yep, I will have them at the conference too. So come come hunt me down and I'll have a bunch there to give away. And I think that each time that you and I say so tonight, we need to put uh, 25 cents in the, in the, uh, in the fund. So I I'll think, put the first 25 I think cents. that's, <laughs> I think that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> it's just such a, 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 a easy way to transition from a pause. Uh, I, I, there's, it there's is. nothing that beats. So I was listening to Google has a new, uh, a, an agent that you can ask it to make go re- go make reservations for you. And I heard some examples of it, and it is phenomenal. You ask the agent to go make a reservation for some hoity-toity restaurant between 6 and 8 p.m., and you let it go. The, the agent then goes out and makes the phone call, and you hear, you know, male or female voice, and it even uses, like, um, while it's in the background processing the speech of the person that you've, what, that it has spoken to. So you say, hi, I'd like to make reservations for Monday night between 6 and 8 p.m. And the person then, oh, um, well, how many are in your party? Um, there will be four. And this is the agent. This is the computer responding. The person on the other end of the phone has no idea that they're talking to a computer. <laughs> My point being is that while the computer, while the Google agent is doing its processing, it will say words like, um while it develops the answer to then repeat back to the, uh, the person on the phone. So that would be the replacement word for. So would be, um, well, that's 25 more cents, Andy. Absolutely. This first article comes from al.com. Paul little John, the third was serving as field director for Sue bell Cobb's gubernatorial campaign in Jefferson County. He had served 30 years in prison for a crime in 1984. He's been arrested he was serving as an unpaid volunteer at a church and the gubernatorial candidate, uh, Ms. Cobb says that it's politically motivated. Once word got out about his conviction and him being a staffer for her and she defended him, then all this other stuff came out. This is just, again, we always come back to the same thing. If you've done your time and you get out, why can't you just move on with your life and try and reestablish? I mean, he was gone for 30 freaking years. I mean, the youngest he could really be is in his fifties, but we just can't let people go. It says, uh, well, I, what I say is it, it says who we are as a people. The reason why this is being done is because it works. When people start calling in to that candidate's office and repudiating that, it will stop being done. Politicians do what works, and it, it, it has to, there has to be a reflection back from the people that we reject this. And I, he, I doubt very many people are calling saying we, we reject what you're doing. He, uh, the Paul Littlejohn uh, had come highly recommended to her. She defended him. She supported him. She knew about it. This other stuff came out, and ultimately he got arrested. Uh, like I said, she says it's uh, politically motivated by the other side. Um. And what you just said, though, is it reflects what we are as a society. And her position is, hey, he came highly recommended and he's doing a good job for me. I don't have a problem with it. The other side had the problem and they made a big stink over it. Uh, that was in Alabama. I just overlooked this yeah. article in the, uh, in the planning for the program. I skipped over it, so I had not gotten familiar with it. it uh, I guess I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not surprised either. Um, it says little John, a registered sex offender is prohibited from working or living within 2000 feet of a daycare center or schools. The church that he was volunteering at had, I, I think it was, we, we started talking about pocket, uh, what are they called? Pocket parks. I think this, this church was operating a, uh, daycare center, but maybe not quite as legitimately, you know, I mean, it just, you know, if you have like two or three kids that stay there during the day, does that exactly count as a daycare? I think it stated some things about like that. But as you said, it reflects who we are as a people. Well, I, I noticed that the, there was a political flavor to it. I tried to read the article, but then music started playing in the background, so I had to close the article. Uh, oh. uh, but but uh, it doesn't come over to me though. Yeah, but it makes makes me not able to hear you. Now, that's not important. 
then I wouldn't know when the next question or next cue. But I, but I saw I saw there was a there was a partisan nature to it though, from the opposition side, and I'm not saying the other side wouldn't do it if they had the same opportunity. But uh, I did I did notice the political party that was launching the attack. Yeah, yeah. Well, then moving on from the State Journal Register, registrants in Missouri moved to surrounding states to get out from under the lifetime registration. If you were sentenced before 2012, registration is 10 years. If you move to another state, you might be able to avoid lifetime registration. And the article talks about people moving to the immediate states around Missouri, like Kansas. And I think that they are talking about those states uh, enacting laws to make the people register for the term that they were sentenced to in a state like uh, uh, in Missouri. But the numbers don't, I mean, there aren't that many people doing it. Well, I read the article. There were several hundred uh, that, uh, that have moved to both Arkansas and Kansas that, uh, that have been convicted. But considering in the, how many people, but how many people are on the registry in those states is in the tens or, you know, in the 10,000 range, probably. So you have a few hundred. It's, I just, it's not like we have a registry tourism industry going on. Well, we we probably do have a fair amount of it going on of, 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 of state shopping and you'd be crazy not to. I tell everybody that uh, although I don't provide the service on behalf of the organization, I will professionally in my independent career provide you that service and help you state shop. And you'd be crazy not to. There, there's there's people who do state shop if you have opportunity to move one state over and have more reasonable chance at getting off the registry. Uh, you'd be you'd be it would behoove you to do so. And, Certainly. And I I see that uh, Arkansas the the director Paula Stitz commented that she does get phone calls of, of people who are who are state shopping. Yeah. And, and it puts pressure on the lawmakers in those states because you just don't find that the citizens, once they know that that a, a number of sex offenders, say it's only 300, but if it's a recidivism rate of 3%, you've got nine new offenses that wouldn't have happened if those people hadn't moved to your state. Right, right. I'm not surprised, and uh, I suspect there'll be. Uh, uh, it's kind of like uh, a co- competition to keep them out. Nevada already, Nevada, excuse me, Utah already closed that loophole, perceived loophole. How so? Well, by saying that you have to register for the t- time oh, in the convicted okay. state. That's what I mentioned earlier. That Utah has already closed that that door. I thought you would do that anyway, though. You know, if you got sentenced to 20 years in state A and you move to state B, you're going to be in in your status of conviction until that time well but but registry is a civil regulatory scheme it's not anything to do with a conviction for your sentence you would serve the amount of sentence that that state imposed on you in terms of the probation term or the parole term but the registry is like taking your car you'll register your car in compliance with what arkansas says kansas loses control of that vehicle when when you register it in arkansas doesn't that make it really hard for the receiving state to then maintain all of the different hodgepodge of rules of the people coming in. It would make it very. It would be administratively a lot more complex, and that's why, why I would argue against that. And if I if I couldn't beat it, if there, if there was such a move underway here, then I would argue really hard to make sure that it worked both ways. If a person comes from Vermont and they have a ten year registration obligation, and we have lifetime, the way the state would want to do it is they would give them the longer of the two times. If you're going to change the law that says that they don't gain any advantage then you should also have that they don't gain any disadvantage. So a, yeah, a, sure, a, a sure, Vermonter sure. should not have to all of a sudden register for a lifetime or 25 years by moving here. If we, if we, if we want to have that uh, a philosophy, let's just be uniform and consistent about it. But I would try my best to wreck that train because it would be very complex. And then if the state of the conviction happens to change their rules, then that would require the state where the person's living to constantly monitor those laws, and that would be that would be very complex to, to, to do that. And you'd have you'd have you would have one cluster, as we call it, without the, <laughs> without the f bomb. I was going to say there's another word there that you're leaving out, isn't there? Well, this is a family program, Andy. Yeah, totally. I'm trying to keep it clean. And moving on, we have an article from ABC 27, and the title is "I Am Not a Monster." And this has been this has been receiving a whole bunch of press across our people, our community. And I grabbed a clip from the uh, the deputy district attorney, Sean McCormick. He would not be on any list if he didn't commit the crime. The purpose of Megan's law is to provide 
information to parents and, and the community. To which, uh, is it Teresa up there? She said, but you don't necessarily even have a right to know about the people living in your neighborhood or around you. Um, I'm glad she said, I'm glad she said that. That's one of the things I'm encouraging people to say is, is that there is no such right. The conviction is, of course, public information, but there is no right to know where people are living or working. And that's what the registry does. And, and uh, so uh, kudos to Teresa in Pennsylvania for, for, for making that statement on air. Do you think that he do you think he knows that and just playing the politics game or does he uh, does he actually believe it? I think I think it's both. Uh, the district attorneys are largely elected uh, by the people, which makes a political uh, consideration uh, relevant. But they also get a lot of pressure from victims advocates to, to uh, the victims insist they have rights that they don't have. And, and uh, uh, since he is uh, primarily the district attorney is working on behalf of victims of right. crime, I think I think that he would be logically taking that position as a as as a person who advocates for the victims that they have such a right, but they don't have such a right, and we need to push back more forcefully that you don't have that right. You have the right to know that they were convicted, but you don't have the right to know anything beyond that. In a per, I, I guess in a. I... In a perfect world, if if you are not convicted and you just go do your your uh, your mechanic kind of job, it's pretty hard for any. If you don't buy a house, if you don't really give a whole lot of paper trail as to your existence, how do you even find out? Maybe in the old days you had the yellow page or the white pages. You would look them up in a phone book, but how would you even like know who your neighbors were if it were ten or twenty years ago? Well, other than other than than socially interacting, you wouldn't know because uh, it was a lot more difficult to get information 20, 30 years ago than it is today. Today, you sit down at your computer and you'd start going to your assessor's uh, or your property tax division's website and, and put in an address, and you can get at least some ownership and some information. But in the old days, you would have had a lot, lot more difficulty knowing. There was a crisscross directory the, uh, that that the larger cities had where you could. You could uh, uh, take an, a, a street. You could uh, look at who lived on a street, and you could reference phone numbers numerically. It was a lot more difficult to figure out who your neighbors were, but you don't have the right to, to know who your neighbors are. And you could pay the phone company back in the day to not list you. You could pay. That was a good racket, wasn't it? <laughs> it will pay. I, I, I don't think it was that expensive, though. You know, a couple bucks a month or something for them to delete your line, which doesn't even make any sense. It's like, hey, can you not keep my stuff in? Oh, it's less work for us. Great. <laughs> Well, it was, it's a, inverted. it was a luxury, just like paying for a long cord and a whole bunch of things that they charged oh, you for, right. which we don't want to divert to, to discussing about that. But, but yeah, there was a charge for not being listed publicly in the in the directory. And I think that the idea of the telephone company, why they did that, was that, that they wanted universal service. And one way to promote universal service was to have something that could be universally used. And it was more universally usable if people could find each other. The telephone was of no use if you couldn't reach anybody. And it made yeah. it a lot more likely that you'd want a phone if you could find who you wanted to contact. So I think that's why the massive publication of printed directories came to be. And the phone company was so – the phone company was known prior to 1984. The phone company, Bell. The phone company was great on, on collecting information and making it available through directory assistance. When you dial 411, which I think if you were to dial now, nothing would happen. I don't think it rings anybody anymore. I thought that still worked. Uh, well, I haven't tried it. Yeah, I don't think that they have directory systems operators anymore. Everybody does that online. Interesting. Hadn't even considered that one. What a tragic loss. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've known people that used to just call directory operators all over the country and just talk to them. Right. Wasn't that run by inmates at some point? I didn't know that. I don't recall that. I've one. heard that. I'm not positive of it, but I swear I've heard that they were 411 operators. I don't know. The telephone company was really, really particular about who they hired. So it was a absolutely it was a prestigious job to work for Ma Bell. I, I'm not talking about when you were a kid. I'm talking more recent, like in this century. Oh, well, I know that, but, uh, that certain <laughs> certain correctional departments have provided inmates to provide uh, tourism information, provide information about their state. Okay. But as okay. far as providing those services for the phone company. I don't remember that. Okay. Um, yeah, just, I, I'm, I'm still baffled. 
I'm, I'm still I'm going to probably forever be trying to wrap my head around the idea of you've committed your crime and you've done your time and perhaps you finished your paper, uh, you finished your treatment, et cetera, that there's never ever an end to the stigma of being a convicted felon, let alone being a sex offender. It's unbelievable. And the way that this guy's putting it out there, the way this uh, McCormick guy is saying, it's like, he fine. The guy did the, the crime. He's like, well, you put yourself there. Just like what Ron book said in his interview with the, um, Defiti, I think is the guy's name in Miami. If I've had, if I pronounce that right, he's like, no, 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 no. Hold up. They didn't, I, the, the system didn't create the registry or excuse me, they didn't create the conviction. You did your crime. You've done this. It's your fault. You put yourself in this situation. And that's where we're going to have to push back. And every offender that gives an interview always concedes the point that, that they're responsible and they're not responsible. I'm responsible. You're responsible for our misdeeds, but we're not responsible for the constitutional infractions that the people have done. And We've got to get people prepared for that question. Aren't you responsible? They need to say, no, sir, no, ma'am. I'm not responsible for unconstitutional laws. And and that list shouldn't exist. Mr. McCormick is right. He wouldn't be on the list had he not pled guilty or been convicted of something. But the list shouldn't exist, Mr. McCormick. It should not exist because that list does things that's not com- constitutionally permissible. And in fact, his Supreme Court just said that. This was a Pennsylvania article, wasn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, his his Supreme Court just said that 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 the lawmakers have exceeded the bounds of what was constitutional. Being a big believer in the Constitution and a sworn officer of the court, I would think he would respect that. That's another conflict I have: is these people put their hand on the Bible and they swear to uphold the Constitution and so forth against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Do they say the same swearing in that the military people do? I'm not sure if it's the same, but it's very similar. It is similar because I know the president says something along the lines with foreign and domestic. So here you are, you, you are, you are bound by your word to uphold the constitution, which has these, which has the framework, the scaffolding behind what is allowed and what's not. And this stuff beyond something like the Vermont one, where you're just mailing in a card every year puts a serious onus on people. I don't know if it's in this article, but when you have to, I, I didn't really consider this, but when you have to list your employer's address, the employer, he may be willing to hire you. He or she may be willing to hire you, but now their information is going to be out on the street and they might not want that exposure. So it's not necessarily that they're not willing to hire you, but it adds just yet another barrier for someone to try and get their life straight and play by the rules. Absolutely. And I, I consulted with an employer just in the last two weeks that let someone go because of the ramifications of the of the employment listing being on the website, that was a heavy consideration. Wouldn't it have been nice if Mr. McCormick had said, rather than what he did say, if he had said, well, I personally support the registry, but the courts have said we've gone too far and we're going to have to go back to the drawing boards and try to comply with the Constitution because the court ultimately has said we trampled it. Wouldn't that have been fantastic if he had said that? Sure. That would have begun to ed- he would have begun to educate the people about what went wrong and the reason why we're in this predicament in Pennsylvania, the reason why we're in this predicament is because the, this uh, Pennsylvania legislature assembly in 2011 decided they were going to crack down and they did this uh, enactment despite the advice to the contrary that they received. They did it anyway. And it took all these years and a lot of blood, sweat and tears and, and they went too far and they're having to, they're having to pull back, but they'll still go as far as they possibly can. And they'll probably have to be more challenges again. But McCormick should realize that the Constitution has limitations in terms of what can be done to people after they pay the debt to society. Putting them on a hit list is not constitutional. Right, right. So it's a good uh, it's a three-minute segment. I, I think uh, people should go check it out. It, it is favorable on our side, at least. I mean, they did have these quotes from this individual, uh, but it seemed to be at, at least it was balanced. But Teresa represented our people well, I think. Teresa, and that's from our uh, Narsal affiliate, Parsal. Correct. Parsal. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the last name. That's why I'm not saying it. Is it Robertson? Robertson, yes. Good. Okay. So, uh, with all, so then, with all of our, our tens of thousands of listeners, you're going to have millions of people moving to Vermont when you keep talking about mailing in the form. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna end up changing their law. 
My bad. Don't move to Vermont. <laughs> so probably what turns out to be like the biggest stink article of the week is a Sports Illustrated article that comes out um, about this pitcher guy. His name is uh, Luke Heimlich, I guess is how you pronounce it up in Oregon State. Not it. Not it giant... not it not it. Did, you, did you say picture or, or pitcher? Pitcher. <laughs> I'm playing, I'm playing pitcher. with y'all know what she said. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm looking at a picture of the pitcher pitching <laughs> on the mound. Anyway, uh, it's a gigantically large article. And there was a lady I saw on Twitter who uh, had some little Twitter storm with someone about it. And she, and she seems to have a lot of background and history on dealing with the registry. She said it was one of the most well-balanced articles that she's ever seen and not, you know, just completely throwing us under the bus. And we go back to, yes, he committed his crime. And the comment of the person that she was talking with, he's, he was specifically stating this guy should never be famous because of what he did. I, I'm, so if you had some crazy kidney disease and he's the super duper specialist doctor, would you give a crap that he did something when he was 15 years old? Or would you be perfectly happy for him to cut you open and fix your kidney? Oh, wait, no, I'd rather die because I have this crazy kidney disease and he's the only doctor that can fix it. I, I, I just struggle with how where the logic comes in that you just want this person to be on the back of the bus forever. It's tragic. Uh, he will probably never pitch in the, uh, in the major leagues. It would be my guess. Uh, that's not my desire, but that's the reality. more than likely the situation. He will create such a distraction for major league baseball. If any team yes. were to dare to touch him, it would be kind of like the Colin Kaepernick. A fiasco right. with, uh, with the 49ers kneeling down, kneeling yep. down. Uh, the, another NFL team will not touch Colin. And I don't think Major League Baseball, they would have to, do, and they can afford it, but they would have to devote a PR person all the time trying to w worry about uh, a, a potential protest of victim's advocates showing up at the ballparks where he's playing. They would have to schedule working around the registration requirements because the registration requirements in Oregon are not the same. And the 32, 34, how many clubs there are this year? So uh, in the in major leagues, but the, but he would he would uh, he would have all sorts of complexities regarding how long he could travel, and then the magic spewing of radiation. He would actually be one of those few that would actually spew radiation after those yeah. number of hours passed because his presence would be well documented when he arrived. When the team, there's some fanfare going with uh, goes with a team arrival. I don't think that Major League Baseball is prepared to to fight that battle. Because the spectators who pay for the tickets are not with the team, with the teams, with, with baseball. The, if they sensed, if, if everybody was calling Major League Baseball owners and saying, you, you do your best to draft him, you do your best to sign him, we want him. But that's not the kind of phone calls they'll be getting. I don't believe he'll ever play in Major League Baseball in the, in the, in the, in the, in, in the National American League uh, in, in the United States. I wonder, though, I wonder if, if economics will kick in. He could be, I mean, they said in the article, he could be a second round draft pick. Hey. I mean, he's a hot, he's a hot product. This might, it might force them to go. Somebody's going to, like, you know, uh, like a decade or two ago when the um, Minnesota Twins the whole movie that was about the uh, money ball where they, they were like the lowest paid team and they ended up going to the, uh, the, the finals and all that stuff because a, a team could pick him up as a massive budget uh, thing. You know, maybe a pitcher makes 10 million a year. Maybe they pay this guy 500 grand and they have a fire, a freaking fire starter on the mound. It could. Well, uh, if he could perform at major league levels with all the potential distractions that would follow him of yeah. media attention and the protests, and I mean, there would be cities he would go to where there probably wouldn't be any protests. Uh, we don't. I have a major league uh, a baseball operation in Albuquerque, where 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 Tripoli city. But but if he came here, we wouldn't care by and large. But there's a lot of cities where the victims' advocates they would greet him at the ballpark with cameras rolling and with media there, yeah. and and it would it, it would it would be very ugly for 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 the owners and. They would stir up such a frenzy in the in the, in the community that that uh, that that the uh, uh, management of those teams are just not going to want that kind of distraction. I, I don't disagree with you. It just seems like there might be enough of an economic power going on there to, uh, hey, we'll at least try it and see what happens. That's big money. He's not some twentieth round draft pick, whatever. He's you know he's a he's a first round starter pitcher that's going to strike out people and that club's going to make a fortune off of having him on the mound 
of winning the uh, winning the games. I don't know. It's interesting to see how the economics plays into this equation. Where if it were just some sort of guy that's going to spin wrenches, no one would give a butt. But in this case, somebody might care enough to give him a shot. Well, it, maybe he'll go to maybe he'll go overseas or something. Well, he could probably play uh, in countries that don't have the the attitudes and the draconian registries. I'm not saying he won't play baseball at, yeah. at a high level, but I'm I'm, I'm going to be very surprised if he plays in the big leagues in this country and at the at the National American League. Uh, baseball. Uh, kudos to the Oregon State University. They've stood behind him. Uh, they, have. they have. They have. They have uh, taken a lot of flack, but they've stood behind him. The uh, liberal do-gooders up there in Corvallis, I believe, is how they pronounce it. I think so. There, uh, there was also something in the article I didn't quite follow on the quirk on how his information came out, uh, but something you know he's he is in a different state, and he goes and does the thing that he's supposed to do, and then a reporter who was covering it did a background check because they said something about no surprises, they didn't want to put something out there on in their little local paper and then end up getting burned by having this guy be, in this particular case, you know, being a convicted sex offender, for something that happened. Eight years, seven years earlier. The way I understand it is his conviction is in Washington State, and, yeah. and he would not have been listed. His, his Washington State doesn't put everybody on the public list, but under Freedom of Information or similar to whatever they call their 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 FOIA request, the the full list was obtained, and he was discovered on the list of people that weren't public, and thus it was made public. Is the way I remember it happening. Right. Right. And it was sealed records, juvenile. It's just, I don't know, man. I'm not saying the guy didn't commit a crime. I'm not saying he should be punished for it. It just, when does it end? And this guy has a, has an opportunity to rise to the highest levels in society. And we're still going to put out some sort of trip line for him and he can't get there. I don't understand it. And, and it, it's, it, it again reflects on us. Uh, there's no one calling yeah. and raising hell. I mean, there's someone calling, but there's not enough people calling to say, leave this guy alone. He's paid his right. debt to society. He was a juvenile. When are you people going to stop? The, yep. Those those kind of calls are not coming in the same quantity that the that the, hate, the hateful calls are coming, like the person who said he should not be made famous. He's not being made famous by for what he did. He's being made famous by his talent and his dedication to excel mm-hmm. at a very high level. That's what's making him famous. There's not a darn thing making him famous about what he did. Yeah, He'd rather, I mean, he'd rather I mean, not have that notoriety at all. Certainly. You're the one, certainly, you're the certainly. one that's giving them notoriety for what he did. He would like you to shut yeah. up. <laughs> Without a doubt. Uh, there's a, uh, just a brief article and it, it's just the, uh, the people that got evicted from, I, I think they call it Bookville four, the previous tent encampment down there in Florida. So now there's Bookville five and, uh, they're not even saying where it is. They know about where the location is of Bookville five, but they don't want to bring a lot of attention to it. But I don't know how you not bring a lot of attention to 75 people living under a bridge somewhere, but there's a new encampment and I just, my heart just goes out to them that they are in, in such a diehard situation to try and find a place to stay. And they're, they're forced to live in a tent. So back to the Utah restrictions. I mean, you know, you could be living in, in a tent under a bridge and cooking on a propane stove every night to make a, bo- uh, a soup or something. Well, if you had the propane stove, uh, it's 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 tragic that this is happening. But it's not just in Florida. We're getting a lot of notoriety. True. But they're living all over metro areas uh, uh, where the restrictions are, are, are horrendous. They're living all uh, – they're being forced out to the fringes of society. And, and it, it's, it's, it's tragic. Of course, I'm one of those who believes that homelessness is a tragedy in America, period. And, and it's escalated dramatically in the last 20, 25 years since we decided we were going to kick people off of uh, AFDC and, and, and disband the program that we used to have that was, that was sort of a social safety net. But what is term- AFDC? A, it was Aid to Families with Dependent Children. Okay. And we've replaced that with welfare reform that is now called Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. And it was block granted to the states. The benefits haven't been increased. There's a five-year lifetime limit, and uh, the, the states have, have been very paltry with what they've done with, with people. So homelessness of families is at ec- epidemic proportions because of the welfare reform that we did back in 96. Well, so I'm, I'm on the get kick about homelessness, period. It breaks my heart to see anyone homeless, but it's even more tragic when the people were capable of supporting themselves, and they're just not allowed. They're not allowed in the land of the free. 
and the home of the brave. Where we have all the rights of the Constitution, they're not allowed to engage into a contract and rent a piece of property. They're not allowed to purchase a piece of property. You Americans need to look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, how did this happen in the good old United States of America that we won't allow a person that has the capability? And there's a lot that don't have the capability because they're not allowed to hold a job either. But people who are right. allowed and capable of finding a place to live, we won't allow them to have a place to live in the good old United States of America. What the hell is wrong with us? But I have seen it said that taxation is theft. I've heard that. And it's a disturbing, I, I, how do you drive to work? Do you drive on roads that were paid for with taxes or do your kids go to school? School isn't free. People claim it's a free education, but we certainly pay for it. And I, I, nobody wants to be taxed a hundred percent for sure, but there has to be some sort of revenue generated for us to support social services that we access as a community. Well, if, if we talk about taxation, we could spend hours talking about taxation. But taxation is what we collectively do that we could not do individually. I don't care how wealthy and successful you think you are and how great you think you are. If it weren't for the things we did collectively, if we hadn't built an electrical, electrical grid, if we hadn't built an educational system, if we didn't have a, a criminal justice system for law and order, if we didn't have mil military protection, or against foreign enemies. We do need some level of military. If we didn't do food safety to keep you safe, if we didn't do all these things, you would not be worth a damn on your own. There's an article <laughs> in Reason Magazine that talks about uh, dropping the food inspection services, I guess they're saying, something like that, the meat inspection uh, process. Uh, what if, hey, I was like, I'm pretty sure that I want my meat somehow inspected to make sure that when I cook it, I don't end up with some crazy disease like the salmonella thing that went on. Was it salmonella with the um, romaine lettuce? Yeah. yeah well, uh, the public health, I was going to go on and on. I mean, with the, with the, with the public health in, infrastructure that we have, if we didn't do all these things, you would not succeed. We built these things because we did them collectively. And now that we have what is a semi-modern infrastructure, there are actually countries in the world that have more modern infrastructure than we have. Uh, uh, but but at, we have all these things and we don't want to maintain them because that costs money and we don't want to build the next for the next generation. I'm glad our four uh, our generations before us weren't as chintzy and as selfish as we are. They built things for us. They did. They did things like uh, uh, the, the Hoover Dam and the interstate highways. And they did things that built for for the future. They, they were they were visionaries. Uh, we, we we seem to have lost that after the space race. Well, after the uh, we, we we've we've kind of said, oh well, I guess we we're doing pretty good. We might as well stop now. <laughs> you know what? So I, we were going to put that comment in about the first and the fourth amendments, and I wrote back to the individual, and this, this is relevant to this. It said, and you know, related to the registry, I said, you know, JFK said, ask not what you can do for your country, but excuse me, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I, I threw that back at him saying, hey, we're in this situation partially because we don't step up. We don't talk to our legislators. We don't donate money to organizations to fund attorney. I don't care which organization it is, but until we collectively step up and push back, we are just as much a cause of the situation as we are a victim of it. Well, I agree that we, we, we certainly bear some responsibility for, for the predicament we're in. And uh, we've, we've, we've kind of gotten very selfish in this country. And we seem Europeans to are not nearly as selfish. They, they are more about the collective good. And we're more right. about the individual. And that's just the way we're wired as Americans. Sound like a damn liberal commie now. We, we need to get you kind of people out of here. <laughs> if you don't like I'm it, probably, Andy, I, if you don't like this country, why the hell don't you leave? Um, you know, I, I, you know, we joke about that. I seriously still think that this is at, at least one of the best, if not the best places to live. I tend to agree. Give, tend given to what agree. is it? 196 countries. I tend to agree. And uh, yeah. uh, it's it, because you want to make our country better. You somehow, you hate the country. Uh, of course, they didn't say that about the president when he was talking about everything was bad about the country. Uh, but but somehow or another, if you're on the progressive side and you want to make things better, you hate the country. No, we don't hate the country. We love it just as much as you do. 
but we want to we want to, we want to improve things about the country and our idea yeah. of improvement may be in, 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 in opposition and different than your idea of improvement I don't of think it's, I don't think what, what what what's been going on the last two years is much of an improvement you contributed this next article from the journal Sentinel Wisconsin Supreme Court urge excuse me urge to force legislate hand in defense lawyer pay. This talks about the public defender wages of being, I want to say they said $20, $40 an hour. So now you have attorneys who in the public sector could make two or three, three or four times as much as a public defender does and have a much more constrained workload. My question to you, Larry, is what does the Supreme Court, what sort of tools in their arsenal, what kind of teeth do they have in trying to get the legislature to write anything that would increase public defender pay? Well, that therein lies the problem. They, we, we've talked about this on a previous episode about what attorneys can do. And, and the courts can only find, like in, in Kansas, I believe the Supreme Court found that the, that the state had not adequately funded education after Governor Brownback's wonderful tax cuts and they drove revenues to the floor and they couldn't find education. And the courts found that they had not adequately funded education as per the constitutional requirements. So the court in Wisconsin can, def, can find that that the uh, indigent defense system is totally inadequate and at forty dollars an hour i can't think of any professional just think about the professionals and they mentioned the dog groomer but think about things you have done professionally <laughs> what mm-hmm. do you pay forty dollars an hour for anymore and these people not only are pay, tr- paying themselves they're maintaining their office overhead out of the, out of out of this so uh it, it's it's not like they're pocketing forty dollars an hour but the typical rate around the country in the federal system is at least a hundred or more an hour under the CJA rates, which is the Criminal Justice Act for Indigent Defense. Uh, uh, but this is this is atrocious. How they'll enforce it if they find that the that the, that it that the that it's unconstitutional, deficient. I don't know what they can do because they really cannot appropriate money. Right. Uh, that that and, and it's interesting that Wisconsin is running a huge sur- surplus. They've been cutting and cutting and cutting. And cutting their way to prosperity, so they think, and they're running a huge surplus. Scott Walker, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're they're running a a surplus because of the of the cuts of hundreds of million. I think the article said four hundred million dollars in the most recent year. That would be more than enough to 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 to, to fund incident defense. But the political will isn't there because I can assure you that the phones are not ringing in the Capitol, urging that public defender pay to represent accused criminals be increased. I just don't imagine there's that many phone calls coming in. And and we go back to the Philadelphia DA who is having his attorneys, has, uh, has prosecutors putting in how much they're going to, how much it's going to cost the citizens to convict somebody uh, to bring fewer cases, except for the most egregious ones. And that will reduce the load on the system. I, you know, I mean, it, it, it's going to happen at mo- so many, so many levels. It's not just one group that's going to have to do it, but we have to, as a society, decide that we don't want to keep putting people away for 20, 30, 50 years for jaywalking. Well, it might be more unlikely to be put away for jaywalking, but I get your point that we're putting people away for long periods of time for, for, for crimes that are relatively on the moderate scale of severity. Uh, Compared to other countries, and I can't remember where I saw this article, there was a, a huge, huge article that was comparing our criminal justice system to the uh, to just other countries, mostly in Europe. And, you know, where they uh, I, the article started out, somebody got he did. He ran a Ponzi scheme. So we'll, we'll use Bernie Madoff as the replacement name. And the guy got sentenced to 16,000 years in prison, something like that. It was it was an unbelievable amount of time because of the uh, the amount of impact he had, but because of the country that he's in, he will serve twenty years. And and I did a, a presentation about that in one of our national conferences in Dallas, and I sh- I showed the comparison of American incarceration rate compared to countries in the world, and we compare very unfavorably with the nations we like to consider ourselves most akin to the European family of nations. We incarcerate at ten times the rate of most European nations. And I asked the audience, uh, and I asked them about the because of the same disparity between uh, within the United States at the rate of incarceration. And I asked them, uh, Americans want to take credit for American exceptionalism, so I'm here today to give you credit for it. You incarcerate yeah. ten times as many of your citizens as a ratio per hundred thousand as your European 
counterparts do. Do that means that means either Americans are inherently more criminal, or Europeans have figured out a better approach. And but they, but we are definitely exceptional incarceration. We 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 have a quarter or a third of the world's incarcerated people, and we're four percent of the world's population. Yes, the article was also discussing. They even some of their like high max security prisons are they don't even have fences. The guards interact with the uh, inmates. They are expected to have a higher level of personal responsibility to manage their own selves and they're managing like money and they have to get to work on time and they have to do all these things on their own in the idea of getting them ready back for society. And I hadn't really considered it from that aspect. I mean, I, I, I've considered the personal responsibility side of it, but from the way that they were designing this, it was like, Hey, we're going to put you over here in this kind of a supervised, just, you know, just, we're going to take you a step back, but you're still going to have to function as a normal citizen in society, but we're going to put you in this own, your own little society, but you're still responsible for you. And we're getting you ready to go back in society. You effed up. It's now your responsibility to fix it. So we can let you back in there and do the right thing. We go the other way. And I hope I don't go too far out in the wings here, but when you have a pet dog or something, they never grow up and become the alpha male because they are always subservient to you. And our prison system is like that. When you go in there, they take away all responsibility. You don't do anything. I mean, you're not responsible for your food or any management of anything. You barely, you know, you can't keep anything in your box as far as material goods. You're not responsible for any sort of hygiene. I mean, you're just like, Hey, I'm just going to exist here and everybody's going to take care of me short of wiping my butt, my butt. And then they open the doors and say, okay, good luck. Yeah. I mentioned this on an earlier episode as well. My liberal do good idea is that, that we should make prison as close as possible, resembling life on the outside. Because the overwhelming majority of people, even with our draconian sentences, are going to be free again. Therefore, it's in our interest that we closely align life behind the walls to life outside the walls. Because when they walk outside the walls, they have to live in a brand new world. And that's not to our advantage for them to fail. It's to our disadvantage because we spend more money and they don't pay taxes. I like the idea of collecting taxes. Since no one likes to pay taxes in America, why are you so damn determined to have people in prison so they can't pay and then they consume resources? I, I, I have a hard time figuring that out. You would want them out working and paying taxes and not consuming uh, taxes. Maybe I'm missing something. <laughs> it also seems odd to me. Uh, I met some people while I was gone that had been locked up so long. They were like, I've never used an ATM card before. And I was like, how? I it just seems, I mean, you know, when I was becoming an adult, that was when ATM cards were coming into play in the late eighties or so. I, it just doesn't even dawn on me that that would be some sort of like a social stigma, some sort of intellectual stigma that you'd have to try and figure out how to cross to like stick your card in the thing, punch in a code and money starts spitting out. You'd be like, this is some sort of voodoo magic, but there are people like that who will not know how to do a Google search, something that everyone just thinks is ubiquitous or how to manage anything from a digital lifestyle. And hey, open the door. Here's 25 bucks. Have a nice day. That is uh, a lot of those people never possess those skills to begin with because uh, they the, 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 the environments they grew up in, they never, I mean, ATMs have actually been around since the 70s. Sure. At least at least because I was using them then. But, but, but uh, if they never were exposed to these things, they, uh, well, we call it rehabilitation. Oftentimes they've never been habilitated initially. For whatever yeah. social failures we had, they they did not they they grew up in an addicted family, they grew up in a dysfunctional one parent family, they grew up in foster care, any number of reasons they 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 grew up in the ghetto, and what we, we I don't like using that term, but people in, in the in the part part of town where education is not valued, and you're doing all you can to stay alive, and they just never were habilitated to start with. We're up on our hour break, Andy, for switching to to a new recording device. You are very astute, and thank you. I wouldn't want you to all lose right. any of this valuable podcast. <laughs> you sound so optimistic all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you take us into this next article from the New York Times? This is an article about, uh, it, 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 it doesn't directly, it's only tangentially connected to the registry, but it's, it's a, an opportunity for me to pontificate about judicial nominations 
because the the the, the executive administration of Washington inherited uh, more than a hundred federal benches, federal judgeships vacant because they all but stopped the Senate under the Republicans stopped confirming judges under Obama. Uh, and they, they were hoping that they would win the presidency. They also stopped, wouldn't even give the Supreme Court nominee, uh, Merrick Garland, uh, a hearing, which was unprecedented. But it's just funny because I saw this one where the, 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 uh, in 2011, Michael Brennan, then a lawyer in, the Milwaukee, in Milwaukee, vigorously defended the right of Wisconsin Republican uh, senator to single-handedly block an Obama administration nominee for the federal bench. Last week, Mr. Brennan was confirmed as a Trump administration nominee to the very same seat, despite vigorous objections by the state's Democratic senator. So five years ago, he defended the, the, the old rule in the Senate that, that they would never confirm a, judici- a, a federal uh, a judgeship if, if a senator from that state objected. They need to get their blue slip or green slip. I forget what they call it, but there's a slip where the, where the senator signs mm-hmm. off on the nominee. And there's a tradition, I think it dated back to 1900s, 1915, 16, 17. And, and uh, so all of a sudden now, the person who defended the right of a Republican senator to single-handedly block Democratic appointments now has said, oh, there's no problem. And he got himself on the federal bench. And they're, they're right. railroading these nominees through. Well, the problem is that often these nominees are not going to be very interested in hearing our issues. They are tend to be very pro-law enforcement, very tolerant of, of the use of law enforcement resources, and very deferential to the passage of laws and excessive sentencing, prison uh, law lawsuits, all the type of things that we're for that we want to deal with. These type of judges are not going to be very sympathetic to our to our our causes, which means we turned a hundred judgeships over that are probably not going to be the type of judges we would like for our issues, and they did such a hypocr- hypocritical about face after they got a new president, they all of a sudden are just rushing these things through. It's 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 total hypocrisy, and I, I just wanted to pontificate. That's why I put it in here. Yeah, um, and I've I've been hearing just the the number of vacancies that were left from the Obama administration, and there are now an unprecedented number of vacancies, and they are on a tear. If you don't hear that the uh, the Trump administration is getting much like as far as a uh, signature legislation, is that the the colloquial term yeah. that they use? So you know, Obamacare would be the the signature legislation, um, but they are. They are going, it says one eighth of the circuit judges in America have been appointed by the Donald Trump administration and the Republican Senate. So that would then, if, if you are looking for conservative judges, you've got them. If you're not looking for conservative judges, then this is definitely not your, uh, not your day to celebrate. Well, and, and since most of our audience, most of our supporters tend to be conservative, as far as they're concerned, they are looking for conservative judges. And then, you, and then you explain to them when you show them on the rulings most of the time that the the way that they rule is not in accordance to what we're looking for, for our cause. That doesn't seem to phase them. Uh, it's like uh, I, I don't I don't understand how to connect the dots any, any better. We're not going to have one of the liberal judges, judges Soda, on the Supreme Court, judges uh, Kagan or Sotomayor, are, 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 they're not going to always be. On, on our side on every single issue, but they're going to be on our side more than Thomas and uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the Chief Justice Roberts and Alito. Yeah. They're going to be on our side more often than they are. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's an odds game. You're not going to have a perfect judge, but you're going just like Gorsuch has ruled in our favor, you know, sort of tangentially, but you know, he he made the decision in our favor. Uh, what, recently well it wasn't really in our favor you talking about on the deportation case i think so yeah. he just he said hey it's unconstitutional what they're doing i'm not you know i'm, I'm not against them being deported he just said you guys are going about this the wrong well, way right you gotta you gotta give them you gotta give them clarity and you gotta that was the void for vagueness which he was correct on that and he took well, like flack people like george will and a few conservatives defended him because he actually got it right it remains to be seen how many things he'll get right judge the late scalia got uh, a few things right of uh, for for particularly on confrontation clause. He got things on, 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 on vagueness. He would not rewrite a statute if, if he could, if, if you couldn't read it into to there, the words. He, uh, but, but he was very deferential to, to, to things that we would not be so deferential to. Uh, when people try to sue prisons and they can't get anywhere, 
Well, that's partially because the, you don't get a lot of sympathy from conservative judges about, about prison conditions, about your so-called rights that you think you have. Everybody says, well, I got all these rights. I said, really? What rights do you think you have in prison? You have very minimal rights in prison. You have a right to, to not be subjected to cruel and unusual punishment. And how that's defined is up to, up to the philosophy of, the, of, of who's making the determination. But you don't have a lot of rights in prison. No, <laughs> and, there are not. And uh, those things are, are largely privileges that, that happen to you in, uh, in prison. And the type of privileges you get are going to be directly reflective of the executive branch who's running the government, whether it be state or federal level. You're going to generally get more privileges in prisons from more progressive administrations. You're going to get fewer privileges and more, more, more harsh conduct, generally speaking, from, from conservative administrations. That's just the way it is. Certainly. And then from Vox.com, I'm a public defender. My clients would rather go to jail than register as sex offenders. <laughs> that, that we can just let that kind of simmer in your brain for a second that you would rather go to jail than to be on the registry, which, Hey, you're probably going to end up on both. So it doesn't really matter much. Uh, but the, uh, the article says that this uh, public defender, when dealing with his clients, he said he would never, he would never have expected that when you're interviewing your client, that, uh, the choices would be, uh, just kill me. Basically just, I, I just send me to jail. I don't want to deal with the registry. If there's a way to, I guess, plea bargain that way around, but that's not how it's going to end up working. That is correct. I've, I've, I've learned that myself, that, that, uh, when you're trying to do plea negotiations, uh, you're trying to plead to something that's not a sex offense. And sometimes people are, will offer to plead to a more serious crime than what the actual, the level of the offense is of the sex offense. They'll say, well, that's a fourth degree felony. I'll, I'll plead to a third degree felony. I'll, I'll yeah. take, I'll take a jail time. Uh, I just don't want to be on the registry. They know how horrible that registration is in most states. Uh, that is something that I have encountered to, to try to craft a plea that will avoid registration. It's a really good article. They cover a lot of stuff. Vox has a gigantic audience. They are very policy driven. I don't, I, I've read that they are left leaning, which is, which is fine unto it's whatever I, but they are just, they talk about the issues of the policy and if it's good or bad and they cover a whole gamut of subjects. Um, but in, you know, so they're covering a whole lot of topics and just like the article that we talked about before the uh, one from the criminal legal news is where it was. Yeah. Criminal legal news. This has a whole history of sexual offenses, but in there, it says there are crimes one would expect to see labeled as a serious sex offense, such as rape, child molestation and sexual assault. But there are also offenses like being in public, which can qualify as indecent exposure. Similarly, grabbing someone's butt or masturbating in one's own car also qualify as a registrable offense, though they might be misdemeanors. But even a misdemeanor gets you on the registry where you have the living restrictions, etc., and then well, even beyond that, there are some of those offenses like uh, a child molestation can be uh, that can be a title simply because of the age. And they're not really right. a child because the, the lawmakers are crafty enough to say, well, it's child molestation if they're a, if they're a minor. Well, they may be yes. they may be very close to being an adult and they're not really a child. But you let that person to, that, that they're uh, calling a child commit an offense and watch how quickly that that same prosecutor doesn't consider them a child. Do you think, though, even with articles like this, towards the bottom of the article, it says there's no proof sex offender registries work. And then organizations like Human Rights Watch, they put out reports of how terrible these conditions are for us. Do you think that it's making a dent in, in the in the public per, uh, perception of the registries and people on it? I do. It's it's gradual. It, it, uh, okay. As I work my way through. I mean, it's going to be moving a mountain. When I work my way through the halls of legislative ledger, uh, there's, there's people who uh, who admit that they've become more enlightened, and then they struggle with how do I deal with the politics of it? How do I? I want to help you. How do I keep from getting creamed by my constituents? What's the answer to that then? Uh, it's it's a tough one. If I had the answer, I would I would be consulting around the country at huge fees. To, 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 <laughs> I, I don't know how you overcome the political reality. On the one hand, we live in what we consider a great system where we elect our our people, and then we get mad when they reflect us. Yeah, when, sure. When, when I said, well, what the hell do you expect? We live in a representative republic where they have to go to you for approval. So they're supposed to stand up to you and say, I don't give a damn what you think. I'm going to legislate would, co totally contrary to what I mean. Really? You actually expect them to do that? 
Right. And, and yeah, and then, <laughs> and then you wonder why. Well, gosh, I wonder why he got voted out. Uh, well, yeah, there might be a reason why. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and, of course, Rush Limbaugh criticized Obama for governing against the will of the people. I think that was his famous quote line. Uh, uh, but but we, we, how we change the people's perception is tough because we don't have resources. If we were the Koch brothers, we would just buy the, the airtime we need, but we don't <laughs> have those resources. Just to go back to your statement about Rush, what he said, Obama won by a pretty good majority. Uh, that doesn't matter. The, the facts doesn't don't matter with certain. Oh, with certain okay. We're in, a, we're in a post fact yeah, era. Yeah, we're, Got we're it. Post fact, fact era. He did win by a significant majority, but 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 Rush said he governed against the will of the people. That's interesting. I would think that if you had, I don't know, I'm just going to throw a number: seventy million people vote for you, and you had a sixty five percent majority, something like that. He had a he had a pretty strong. He had a pretty strong. Well, it wasn't quite winning. that strong. It was in, it was in the fifties, but but he won he okay. won handily. He he at least had a majority of the people. The current president did not. <laughs> because if anybody's governing against the will of the people, I mean, hello. C- c- contrary to his statements of such things. Well, but the the mathematics don't reflect that. He got three and a half million votes fewer than his opponent, so he did not get the majority. All right. So before we end up losing all of our listeners due to talking politics too much, (laughs) we did receive a voicemail message. And so here's an individual that I've been communicating with a lot lately and uh, wants to remain as anonymous as possible. But so here's the voicemail message. Hey, yeah, I just wanted to say that registered citizens who have the means should hire competent attorneys and sue in federal court to have these draconian laws found unconstitutional. I also wanted to stress how very important it is to hire an attorney rather than going in pro se, that asking the wrong legal questions can be disastrous. I also wanted to say that I really enjoyed your podcast. Thanks. What a, I know that's going to be music to your ears. What a ears. great comment. <laughs> uh, that whoever that is, I uh, appreciate, we appreciate that. Uh, we agree with you that uh, those, those people who have the ability to contribute towards uh, legal funds or individual actions, it's it's much more preferential to contribute to legal funds because very few people have the wherewithal to fight the government, be it state or federal, alone. So contrary, and I owe twenty five cents for that. So so contrary to <laughs> to uh, About three more too. <laughs> <laughs> so contrary to to uh, that's seventy five cents now. Contrary to, to what we like to be such individuals in America, we have to do this together. We have to come together and we have to work together collectively to fight because the system is collectivized against us. The, 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 the state government or whatever state we're trying to challenge, they have the collective resources of the people's taxation. We have to do it together. So I agree with him. I, the danger of going pro se, you get bad case law. And I'm I'm delighted that he likes that he enjoys the podcast. That's really 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 nice. I hope that he'll spread the word to others. Ready to be a part of Registry Matters? Get links at registrymatters.co. If you need to be all discreet about it, contact them by email, registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You can call or text a ransom message to 747-227-4477. Want to support Registry Matters on a monthly basis? Head to patreon.com slash registry matters. Not ready to become a patron? Give a five-star review at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Or tell your buddies at your treatment class about the podcast. We want to send out a big heartfelt support for those on the registry. Keep fighting. Without you, we can't succeed. You make it possible. Finally. Actually, so... For that individual, twenty-five cents, Andy. I know, I know, I know. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Here we go. Here we go. There. <laughs> uh, so I, I will get in touch with him, and uh, and and he will be receiving one of our brand new blue balls. <laughs> but we don't know who he is. How can we give him? How can I, we give him blue I, balls? I I have his uh I have his contact information. He oh. just wants to remain anonymous. For our feature tonight, Larry, are you ready for this? I'm ready. I hope we have enough time. We do. We do. This won't take us terribly long. Why GPS monitoring should be one of the seven deadly sins. You sent me a couple articles on the failures of people being put on GPS monitoring. And while I'm a big tech aficionado, and I just think it's the best and it's going to save everybody in the whole world. 
I do absolutely realize that if you are put on a restriction scheme that would have you go back to jail or prison for being within X number of feet of a thing, well, they're not that accurate. So why what don't we, uh, tra- uh, yeah. So why don't we, again, <laughs> why don't we trade <laughs> spots? You go first. What's the uh, first reason that GPS monitoring should be one of the seven deadly sins? Well, uh, there's just so many of the, of the, or malfunctions, uh, the malfunction in the charging. Uh, the, if, if it if it loses its charge, it loses communication with the satellite. That can that can that can land you in jail. Suppose you're one of those people, perhaps living in the tent city in Florida, and you don't even have access to power. That could land you in jail. That's that's tragic. And 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 if you live in an urban area, uh, finding power with cell phones being so prevalent it is. Not impossible. If you if you look semi presentable, you can sometimes sneak in and get power uh, if you can afford to buy a soda. But but access to power can be difficult if you're not in a in an urban uh, setting. Imagine if you were in a more rural area where there was only one diner in town. Can you imagine that you 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 end up going into a Starbucks and you're just sitting there, and then you get arrested? And you why would you get arrested for sitting at Starbucks? Well, those two guys a couple of weeks ago got arrested oh, yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. Don't, 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 I'm don't, making don't, a little play on that. If you just sit in a I, Starbucks I, and you're sitting I next to a power outlet, oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they were. They, I think they went to the bathroom or wanted to go to the bathroom. They were. They say they were sitting there waiting for a friend. Mm-hmm. So they were. They were. They were. Uh, they were arrested for being black. You could spend a week or more in jail for an unspecified violation. Well, the, uh, the, the, the signal, ahead. the signal, uh, uh, I know here in my rural state, we have a lot of, have had a lot of issues with, uh, with, with the signal being, being able to receive it. And like, like out on reservation land, they, they couldn't even get, release anybody to their families because they could not have a, a, a they didn't have the a, a cell, they didn't have the ability for the GPS to operate. I don't know if they've overcome that, but, but that's another problem. For the unspecified violations, they used an example that, you know, you may visit too close to a a library or something like that, and it could have lost communications or it just kind of bounced and, and, and jittered, I guess you could say. And it, and it threw you across the line. They err on the side of, Hey, we need to arrest you to check for compliance versus, Oh, you just drove by, but it looked like you were there for an hour. Well, my understanding is if, if if they if they lose connection with a satellite, then they would have no way of knowing where you were during that period of time. If they happen to lose if the satellite, if they dropped you at a, at a at near an exclusionary zone that you were legitimately uh, passing through, passing by, and then you were off grid for some period of time, what? What happens to that poor person who did nothing wrong, but the the the, the device loss communication with satellite? What do we do? And therefore, by spending time in jail, you could lose your job, which could lead to a loss of housing, could lead you to living to a, in a tent city in Miami Dade County. It it happens, and and the accuracy of the of of how close the of the feet, how many feet they can be precise with it. If you have a, a an exclusion zone that says you can't be within 500 feet or whatever it may be and and the thing is is, is the, the i'm not a tech geeky at all but uh are they accurate within 25 feet or less uh, wh- what's the accuracy of the of of most of the technology that they're using out there these days on 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 pinpointing your precise location and movement how how close can they resemble where you are so the website for gps.gov says like in best case scenario, if they can see all of the satellites that are available at that time, it's a 16 foot radius. It doesn't matter whether your restriction zone is 500 feet, a thousand feet at 10 miles. It doesn't matter if you then are at a maximum of that. If you end up within 16 feet of whatever that distance zone is, which then that could even float higher. If it can only see two satellites, if you can only see, if you can only see one, you're not even going to get a location, but it needs to see three to triangulate you. Usually they can see like five or six to get you down to that 16 foot zone, but there could be trees, bad weather could be obviously buildings around. If you're in, you know, like some sort of urban area or a city area. So yeah, now you're down to only 16 feet. They could be accurate to a hundred feet. And now you're, you know, a 10th of a mile away and you get, you get jammed up. Well, 
uh, I was thinking in terms of my limited brain power, the more exclusion zones you have, then the likelihood of you, if you're within, if there are four things right nearby in an urban setting that you're all excluded from being around, and the thing is only accurate within 16 feet, you've got four chances of it putting yep. you. Uh, that's what I was trying to get at in my sure. Uh, yeah, way. you're not. I, uh, yep. I, I was just thinking like you're like taking a step towards the library, another step towards the library. And at some point in time, you set off some sort of buzzer in the PO's office. And if you're at 100 foot accuracy, you could just be walking down the street a, a block away and they get their alarms going off and you're you're screwed. And you didn't do anything. You had nothing on your mind that looked nefarious. But now they're just going to err on the side of caution and take you in. Well, that's what I was going to say in terms of if if the person is, is struggling and they're using public transportation or even foot transportation or bicycles, they're going to be moving very slowly if they're using if they're if they're walking. That may look like that you're loitering, but how Correct. fast can a person walk? Yep, a couple uh, three miles an hour. Uh, so so they're loitering when they're actually just moving at the at the speed they can move, yep. and and uh. I've I have come to the belief that GPS has become nothing but a big business, Certainly. a mega mega business, with a lot of money being made, a lot of people being sent to jail, incarcerated because of 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 the of the technology, and it was supposed to be an assistance tool to help us. It was not supposed to be a supervision tool. It's supposed to be something that helps and assists a PO to to manage a person that might have boundary issues. To use it as a discipline tool for rather than sending one some to, to jail to say I'm going to give you a curfew and by golly I'm going to make sure that between the hours of for the next 30 days between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. that you don't leave because I've got a little tracking device to let me know if you now in those situations it's fairly accurate unless you live in a very very small apartment mm-hmm. in a very highly densely populated where, where, where if you go outside the the in the hallway. But 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 that it's a it's a device that's been misused, but it's been promoted by big business because there's big profits, and our capitalist system works really nice at extracting profits. Pretty efficient at it. It it is indeed. It generates the demand, then it generates the. This is you know, we talked about about uh, uh, can you generate demand? Yes, you can. You you brought the Apple example. They 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 invent a product, and they create a demand for it. Yes, the, the, the GPS has been invented and, and, and perfected and, 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 and adapted, and, and they've they've got it, and they've created demand by going on these roadshows all over the country and convincing supervising authorities what great devices they have, and convince legislative bodies to buy into this. And they've got all these people. Uh, I wish we could find a statistic how many people, both in pre-trial supervision, and in post-trial supervision, parole supervision, post-prison supervision. I wish we could find out how many people have these electronic devices strapped on them. Then we could try to extrapolate how much money is being made off of how many billions of dollars that this business has become. Well, yeah, I I don't have any doubts about that. It would definitely be big numbers. Did you see the article this past week about Securus? I think it is uh, the telephone company that is doing uh, stuff for prisoners and they, uh, they're able to pinpoint almost anybody's cell phone regardless I, of carrier and all that i did see that i didn't completely understand it but i saw it um so yeah it's the company that provides a lot of the telephone services inside prisons and there, i, I want to say it was some sort of um it was a marketing tool for the cell phone companies and they were able to tap into the way the records were and they could pinpoint anybody forget fourth amendment forget any of that they type in your phone number and they can get your location right now Granted, it's going to be within that 16-foot window, <laughs> at least. Well, what is their – did they have a justification for needing to uh, to, to know? Uh, or is that just something that goes with the, 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 the technology? Is there a need for a prison to know where someone is that, that, that they're talking to on the outside? I didn't see any re- – I, I, I could I could see why they, where they would make the argument for knowing because fewer and fewer people have landlines so they're going to have cell phones and then you could get a cell phone in any market you want you could you know order it over over and I could get a New Mexico number if I wanted to now I call 
my cousin who's in prison in New Mexico and I'm paying local rates, you could then determine that the cell phone isn't being used from that location and now you should charge them out of state rates. I could I could kind of see their 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 angle on that even though that's still scummy cuz nobody pays long distance rates anymore. Well, would they be able to make a security uh, argument as well when they make the when you were calling a landline if they needed to do an investigation about a call that went to a particular number, they had a place to go because there was a terminating point of that of that landline. Do do they need to have the same capacity for security reasons to go able to to to, to contact the terminating point of anyone who's received a call from within the institution? Uh, possibly yes. Sure. I mean, yeah. If you start talking about something that you know triggers their their flag words, then yeah, they would want to do further investigation. In in the in the information that I saw, they were they were tracking some politicians, like judges or something like that. They were they were aware of the location of people not necessarily related to the uh, prison system. These were these are just anybody that are not receiving calls from the prisons. Correct. Yeah. No, they could track anybody. They could track oh, you right now. Yeah. It wasn't just specifically related to that. Well, I would think they would have less of a claim to have access to that to the, the information. That seems like a gross encroachment. It is absolutely that. I'm going to try and work out with someone that does a really neat job with making images and give them an idea of the articles that we're covering and, and a theme. So this week we have an image of um, our favorite person to hate out of, out of Florida and who has a scorched earth policy. And I think I have a neat image. So if you want to check it out, go uh, check out the website and there'll be an image posted with this, this article with this episode. And, uh, if you're listening to it via the download part, then you might not see it. So you need to make a special trip, but those visiting the website will see it prominently displayed. So how do people contact us if they want to, to, to reach us, Andy? You've got a whole slew of ways. You could visit the website, registrymatters.co. I would definitely like it if more people followed us on Twitter. I've been pretty active over there during the week, posting clips from the episode. You could email us at registrymatterscast at gmail.com. Or you could call and leave a voicemail message like we played tonight at 747-227-4477. Well, I can't believe we still get old-fashioned phone calls, but I'm glad we do occasionally. Yeah, this, this person, is this person. I couldn't get him to do anything. He was so paranoid about Big Brother watching and all this stuff. It's, it's kind of it's humorous in a certain way. It's really sad that we would have people that think that way on the other side of that. But well, yeah, I, people I actually still do appreciate more, more phone calls uh, the, the, if people would make them because we can play them. Yep, absolutely. And, and I love the spoken word more than the written word. Definitely. I like we have an hear, outgoing. Go ahead. I, I like to hear your inflections and to try to deduce yeah. a little bit from the voice when I hear it spoken. And I, when I read the words, you can do the same thing to some degree, but I just like to hear them. So please leave us some, some messages. An outgoing quote is, you can't, be an, uh, you can't be an important and life-changing presence to some people without also being a joke and an embarrassment to others. That's Mark Manso, and that's the outgoing quote, which is all I got, Larry. I love it. Have a great night. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Good night.